and it's my honor to introduce you to Mark Bronski. He's our orthodontist. He's a Next Gen Face board member. He studied all over the world. Uh, he is a fellow of the American College of Dentistry. He's also a member of the prestigious Angle Society of Orthodontics. And he's going to give us a talk on orthodontic preparation for cleft and craniofacial care. My name is Mark Bronski, and I'm a specialist in orthodontics and dental facial orthopedics and part of the Next Gen Face cleft and craniofacial team. My goal today is to discuss the role of orthodontics and dental facial orthopedics in cleft palate and cleft lip and palate and craniofacial treatment. Dental facial orthopedics, or early treatment as we describe it, is the favorable modification of skeletal growth and development in the sagittal, vertical, and transverse planes of space. Guidance of eruption is the affecting permanent spa space for permanent teeth to come into the dental arches safely without having to extract teeth. And our other goal here is to prepare the skeletal foundations and dental arches for fixed or removable appliance therapy to optimize dental occlusion. Normal facial growth and development is, uh, is characterized by a downward and forward growth of the maxilla and mandible with the cranium remaining roughly the same size after approximately six years of age, and, and the majority of growth exhibits in the lower third or quarter of the face. The maxillary growth center is believed to be in the cranio-maxillary junction, and the mandibular growth center is believed to be in more of the condylar segments. As you can see here, the lower third to one quarter of the face is what we generally, as orthodontists and dental facial orthopedists, tr attempt to modify to optimize the patient's skeletal and dental foundations. Here's a representation on the left of the craniomaxillary suture where most of the growth center is, and we utilize that to the patient's advantage in trying to modify growth. Additionally, you can see here the symphysis of the mandible is believed to be relatively stable throughout one's life, where most of the growth happening in the ramus and condylar segments. Here's a representation of superimposed lateral cephalometric radiographs that show a patient between ages 9 and 12 and how they tend to grow. You can see here from the superimposition on the base of the cranium, which does not change after 7 years old, the forward and downward growth of both the maxilla and mandible. As orthodontists and dental facial orthopedists, we also are very concerned with creating enough space for the natural teeth to come into place. I hear the story every day about my kids' teeth used to be in perfect alignment and now they're not. What happens is as the body grows, the dental alveolus grows with it, sometimes in an ample fashion and sometimes not. And we are charged with making additional space to aid in the guidance of eruption of permanent teeth into the dental arches. Mother Nature gives us quite a gift in that the primary molar teeth, as you can see here, are actually a little bit larger than the permanent ones that will succeed them, so it's up to us to manage that extra space to get the best alignment of teeth possible. The etiology of abnormal dental facial growth and development is about 5% in the human population. What we see are congenital anomalies, developmental disturbances, syndromes, endocrinological abnormalities, pathology, environmental influences, neuromuscular imbalances, and many other causative factors. Common dental facial deformities we see on the craniofacial team are cleft lip and palate, cleft palate, Piero Ben sequence or syndrome, hemifacial microsomia, Apert syndrome, Cruzon syndrome, and Russell Silver syndrome, to name a few, severe class two or class three malocclusion, degenerative joint disease, and a whole host of other abnormalities that we see. The orthodontic orthopedic treatment methods commonly used for dental facial deformities patients include maxillary skeletal expansion, functional appliance therapy, both therapy, both removable and fixed, as well as extra oral traction, commonly called headgear or face mask. Fixed appliance therapy, braces, removable appliance therapy, clear aligners, and a combination of orthodontic therapy with dentoalveolar surgery, orthognathic surgery, plastic surgery, and other adjunctive surgical procedures. In cleft lip and palate treatment, patients are treated from the effectively from the time of birth, as mentioned by Dr. Brecht, and a series of ongoing treatments are undertaken as previously covered. 
Orthodontics and dental facial orthopenics is often implemented around the time of the, of the dental alveolar bone grafting. Maxillary skeletal expansion is often affected to create an optimal environment for bone grafting to begin uh, bony integration of the maxillary segments and to aid in guidance of the permanent teeth to erupt into the maxillary arch. A patient presents to the orthodontist uh, max, first maxillary skeletal expansion prior to the bone grafting, and either a standard or a fan expansion appliance is used to separate the segments in preparation for bone grafting. Here's a graphic of a patient with unilateral cleft lip, maybe palate, bilateral cleft lip, maybe palate. That's what we see all the time in our group. This patient came to the craniofacial team following, uh, well, not following, but after nasoalveolar molding, again discussed with doc by Dr. Brecht, and the patient was able to realize moving the premaxillary segment into closer proximity to the arc of the maxilla, uh, clearing the way for us to be able to expand the area in the front segment here in order to optimize the environment for bone grafting. This is a representation of a fan expander which is activated anteriorly with this jack screw appliance to gently, slowly, and carefully widen the premaxillary region, not beyond two millimeters if possible, in preparation for bone grafting. Here's the patient following fan expansion and after placement in the maxillary arch of a clear plastic shell retainer that is meant to hold the expansion that we achieved prior to uh, bone grafting surgery, and then to maintain it following bone grafting surgery as a bandage following the procedure. This is a representation of a bone grafting procedure where the soft tissues are reflected. Bone grafting material from any source chosen by the surgeon is placed, and then the tissues are covered, allowing the patient to heal up in that region, affecting a continuity between the maxillary posterior and anterior segments, and also allowing bone for eruption of the permanent teeth that are in the cleft or around the cleft site. Here's the patient before and after the fan expansion and bone grafting. And as you see here very clearly, this is the very well placed max, uh, premaxillary region prior to the bone grafting. Here you can see the beginning of the knitting of the bone and the soft tissues uh, following the bone graft done by our own NGF surgeon, Dr. Stephen Warren. From the frontal, you can also see the significant clefting and the reduction thereof. From the side view, you can also see the same. What I'd like to point out here is that uh, as the patients have lip adhesion surgery, the maxilla tends to not translate anteriorly and inferiorly as described previously during normal facial skeletal growth and development. So it's our job as dental facial orthopedists to protract the maxilla skeletally uh, at the proper time in growth and development to try to reduce or eliminate the class three or underbite situation that has both maxillary uh, deficiency and relative mandibular excess. So a patient with severe class three malocclusion is treated with maxillary skeletal orthopedic protraction and called extraoral traction, called Dallaire-type face mask, is usually the treatment of choice. Bone-anchored maxillary protraction treatment is also considered as an alternative. Here's a graphic representation of that class three malocclusion that you just saw. And here's a patient with, as you can see, a severe class three malocclusion, or underbite as it's commonly called. And uh, you can also see from the facial profile, mid-face uh, deficiency and relative and absolute mandibular excess. The patient utilizes, or we utilize for the patient, a Dallaire-type face mask that, that exerts traction anteriorly and inferiorly on the maxilla to try to attempt to correct the skeletal class three malocclusion. We more often than not overcorrect so that if we get any sort of relapse, we still have our class three correction. And here's the patient, as you can see, following uh, maxillary skeletal protraction. And you can see an immediate change uh, it takes months to happen, but you see an immediate change in the actual mid-face fill as well as the mandibular excess, which has disappeared. At this point, it's our job as dental facial orthopedists and orthodontists to ex further expand the maxilla, create space for the teeth to come into the arch naturally. We hope for natural guidance of eruption. And following further expansion, you can see how the permanent teeth have 
begun coming into, into place and utilizing our lingual arch to uh, utilize our leeway space to the greatest degree possible. Following, uh, following ample expansion and guidance of eruption, we then chose in this patient's case to use fixed appliance therapy to establish the most physiologic and functional occlusion possible and then monitor the patient for years thereafter to make sure that the class three doesn't then recur. Here's the patient frontally before and after. Here's the patient occlusally before and after. You can see just by uh, eyeballing that there's significant expansion. And you can see here from the frontal view, the class three occlusion was corrected via orthopedic means. Here's the patient laterally. These are actually primary teeth that have no successors that will be corrected when, they, uh, when it becomes time to replace them with prosthetic replacements, likely implants or bridges. Often at the craniofacial team, we'll see patients with, with cleft palate and no cleft lip. It's a, it's a very different series of surgeries as the surgeons will tell you, but it often presents to me with dental anomalies that are not uh, all that similar to what we see in actual cleft lip and alveolar clefting as well. In a case uh, like this, you see just clefting in the palatal region with often an intact alveolar process. And what you see right in the middle is another graphic representation. It's, it's neither normal nor cleft lip and palate, but just simple cleft palate. So the patient that uh, I was fortunate enough to treat with my colleague, Dr. Brecht, and the anomaly that we see here is the patient was born without a second central incisor, which is what is termed a cyclops tooth. And you can see just from looking at the uh, frontal view, the patient has a severe maxillary skeletal constriction, a submucous cleft palate, and significant wear and tear attrition on the primary teeth. So it was our charge to expand the maxilla as much as we possibly could skeletally, and then to make a plan with the team, which we did, to extract the cyclops tooth, consolidate spaces of the lateral incisors and cuspids to substitute for the incisors, attain the best dental occlusion we could through orthodontic therapy, and then to top this off with excellent prosthodontics to improve the patient's dental occlusion and dental facial aesthetics. Here you can see that the cyclops tooth has been removed and that expansion is underway. You can see that braces have been placed to consolidate those spaces as expansion continues. And then following significant growth and a, a bit of a waiting time, we then reinstituted treatment with fixed orthodontic therapy to attain the most optimal, what we call class one occlusion in the, in the anterior and posterior segments, leaving space for maxillofacial prosthodontist uh, to replace those teeth to optimize both incisor occlusion as well as dental facial aesthetics. This is the final uh, presentation of the patient uh, improving his uh, both occlusion and smile aesthetics. Here's his timeline, which you can see does take quite a while, as mentioned by the other practitioners in the next generation face. But with good planning, it seems to be well worth it for the patient's long-term uh, health and cosmetics. Often patients will present to next gen face with something called Pierroban sequence or syndrome, which is when an infant presents with a smaller than normal mandible, uh, possible cleft palate, and obstructive tongue that may induce difficulty in breathing. Often if the issue is, is uh, grave enough and the patient can't breathe at birth, something called a distraction osteogenesis done, genesis is done, which is a surgery that helps create a patent airway that allows the patient to thrive. When the patient does get to the orthodontist and orthopedist, what we do is do our best to modify skeletal growth and development in the vertical anterior and posterior planes of space while guiding eruption of teeth into the arches. And you can see here is a graphic representation of micromandible and constricted airway. This patient presented with Piero Ben sequence with uh, a patent but slightly constricted airway, a severe maxillary skeletal constriction, severe class two occlusion, meaning the maxilla is way in front of the mandible, a deep bite and, and uh, impacted teeth. What we chose for her was something called a fixed functional appliance, which helps solve all of those problems uh, simultaneously. As you can see here, there's a maxillary skeletal expansion component, telescoping arms to advance the mandible to 
aid and abet growth in the condylar segments, as I had shown previously, since the mandible does grow primarily in the posterior segments, as well as utilizing uh, the telescoping arms to act as a headgear effect to pull upward and backward on the maxilla to attempt to balance the dentition and the skeleton. Following proper uh, or the best degree, the greatest degree of alignment and uh, skeletal changes that we could achieve, then used braces to achieve the best occlusion we possibly could. However, you can see that even though there is great degree of improvement of the smile aesthetics and the dental occlusion, the patient does end up with a significant mandibular deficiency uh, going forward. That would allow the patient, when, when she uh, achieves full physical maturity, to opt for what would likely be a bimaxillary skeletal surgical advancement to further optimize the dental occlusion as well as dental facial aesthetics. Here's a representation of the before and after of the maxilla, the before and after of the frontal, and the lateral. Often with dental facial deformities and disharmonies, we see patients with severe skeletal anterior open bite malocclusions. This is usually due to an aberrant skeletal growth of the maxilla and mandible, often relating, relating to airway issues, with ramifications with masticatory function and speech reduction, as Ms. Shelley Cohen just discussed. Orthopedic growth modification at the appropriate time in development can reduce or eliminate the anatomic and functional dysmorphia. Here's a representation of a patient with a severe skeletal open bite, a severe maxillary skeletal constriction, and as you'll see in the next slide, severe class two malocclusion or relative mandibular deficiency, as well as crowding of the teeth. Here's the representation of the skeletal class two occlusion. We chose to use something called a removable functional appliance or a Frankel II appliance to help guide eruption and to help guide the growth of the maxilla and mandible all simultaneously. Following utilization of that appliance and continued follow-up care to ideally adjust this appliance, we're able to get some bite closure and following this, we did further expansion of the maxilla, extraoral traction or headgear to get as much bite closure as possible, getting us to here. At this point, it was the patient's choice whether or not she wanted to do fixed appliance therapy, braces, or clear aligner therapy uh, to finish the occlusion and achieve the best uh, possible result possible. She chose clear aligners and we were able to achieve the bite closure and the bite and the occlusal establishment of class one bilaterally. Here she is prior to treatment, here she is following treatment seven years later with an acceptable uh, dental facial result. Lots of expansion as you can see again eyeballing it and space uh, bite closure that will allow her to chew, function, and speak. Often at the uh, NGF craniofacial team, we'll, we'll take on patients who have already had treatment uh, elsewhere. And this patient uh, presented to us who had a history of very successful nasoalveolar molding, had surgeries to the lip, nose, alveolar, bone, and palate, two rounds of orthopedic protraction, maxillary skeletal protraction, as discussed previously, as well as prosthodontics to reshape and restore the, the permanent cuspids that we're substituting for lateral incisors. The goals at transfer were for me to finish the orthodontic therapy and observe growth and development for possible future treatment, including orthodontic surgery and prosthodontic restoration of the dentition. I received the patient at this uh, point, cleft palate, cleft lip, finished his orthodontics with positive overbite and overjet, and then watched him grow. And after uh, growing for several years, he did grow into a class three occlusion, which he then decided he wanted to have uh, maxillary uh, dental uh, skeletal surgery, which is represented here by a maxillary Lefort I osteotomy for advancement of the maxilla to optimize his occlusion and aesthetics. Patient could not have restorations because the upper and lower teeth were right on top of one another. So he underwent orthodontics, surgery, finishing the orthodontics, as well as excellent prosthodontics by our own Dr. Lawrence Brecht, uh, attaining the desired results. And again, it took 
quite a bit of time, but we were able to establish the patient where he and we wanted him to be. Often patients present with uh, other different syndromes like Russell Silver syndrome, uh, which is caused by several uh, potential uh, etiologies such as intrauterine molding, poor growth after birth, etc. The patient's chief concern was space closure uh, and cosmetics. We did just that. We closed his space, but uh, the team planned to do orthognathic surgery at full physical maturity which we were able to do. We held him in place for several years and then planned to do a bimaxillary surgery to advance the maxilla with a Lefort one osteotomy advancement and a sagittal split setback to correct his class three malocclusion. Here's the patient prior to surgery, following surgery, and following orthodontics, and following prosthodontics, which he had done in the Midwest. The patient does have a functional occlusion at this time, and since he is in the entertainment industry, was very happy for his uh, functional and aesthetic change. And finally, uh, we see disturbances in the temporomandibular joint development that can be a cause that can be caused by either condylar agenesis, degenerative joint disease, specifically juvenile idiopathic arthritis, or trauma. Patient presented after several years of orthodontic therapy with an open bite and inability to chew and having speech impedance. But we could do nothing at that point because uh, fixed orthodontic therapy would do very little for him and he was not old enough or mature enough physically for surgery. So for several years, we took series of uh, lateral cephalometric x-rays, traced them to see when he had his definitive cessation of growth. More photos, more x-rays, more tracings. And at 20 years and five months, he had uh, definitively finished his growth and decided to embark on orthodontics and orthognathic surgery. You'll see that uh, the rendering is remarkably similar to what the patient was living with and what ultimately happened. The patient was prepared for a maxillary osteotomy for maxillary impaction, a sagittal split advancement, and a genioplasty or chin advancement to aid in lip competence and facial cosmetics. Here's the patient prior to surgery after set up orthodontic therapy. Here's the patient following surgery and the patient following his orthodontic treatment. This, this remarkable surgery was done by our own Dr. David Hirsch, uh, uh, part of our uh, NGF craniofacial team. So if you look at the timeline, you can see that when we first saw the patient until we finally finished, it was quite a bit of time, but uh, well worth the effort. As you can see here, this is where we started. This is where we finished. In summary, I'd like to say the cleft and craniofacial patients usually require a long-term strategy necessitating multiple treatment methods with a team of specialists working together to affect the desired results. Early treatment entails modification of growth and development via orthopedic and orthodontic treatment. Intermediate and subsequent uh, therapy often involves revision treatment, including skeletal and soft tissue surgical procedures to optimize clinical results. I'd like to offer my, my deep thanks to Next Generation Face, the cleft and craniofacial team for allowing me to participate in their fantastic group, as well as Lenox Hill Hospital uh, and Northwell Health. I'd like to, in memoriam, uh, honor Dr. Donald Bronski, who tra treated cleft and craniofacial patients for his 40 years of practice, as well as my professor, Dr. William R. Prophet at UNC Chapel Hill for teaching me effectively everything I know about cleft and craniofacial as well as I'd like to thank my world-class correspondence coordinator who helps me put together all these, uh, these presentations and is a fantastic steward of uh, our PowerPoint presentations. Thank you very much.